The Department of Humanities and Social Sciences welcomes you all to the Professor Shujit Mohan Chandra Le Memorial Lecture being organized for the first time in your august presence. The occasion is special for us as this year marks the birth centenary of the legendary late professor. We begin our program with an inaugural song. Ms. Atre Banerjee, student of the MSW program of our department, will sing the inaugural song.
I now request the honorable guests, the faculty members and the family members of Professor Chondu to pay their respect to the late professor. I request Dr. Arindam Moda, head of the department, to preside over the program.
first of all i welcome all of you to this uh, professor sm chandra memorial lecture being organized for the first time but i must say something about the genesis of this program it was dr rama kundu professor chandra student and my teacher who first suggested that nit durgapur uh, if they can organize a program in honor of professor chandra and she wanted to pay her tribute to her late professor and phd supervisor probably that was the first uh, phd research work being done at uh, uh, the nri college so um, it was under badwan university then but uh, even at that time professor chandra had supervised the research work and it was uh, dr rama kundu is uh, very distinguished uh, student who had done this research work so obviously it was a rare achievement at that time uh, during the ari college days and it was not even a deemed university now it is nit durgapur an institute of national importance so she suggested that uh, she wants to pay her tribute to her late professor and Uh, if we can do we could do something so obviously i readily accepted the proposal and uh, told my colleagues and coincidentally uh, during that time i was met the head of the department so uh, my colleagues also readily agreed to my suggestion so obviously that is the result of this program this is the result of that uh, suggestion so we are grateful to dr rama kundu she has contributed rupees 1 lakh for the formation of uh, professor sm chandra memorial fund endowment fund along with her professor chandra's daughter smriti uh, sulekha sen she she also contributed rupees 1 lakh to that endowment fund and professor chandra's son uh, mr suresh chandra he has also Uh, suggested that he and expressed his willingness that he would like to contribute to that fund so obviously we are grateful to all of them from the next year whatever proceeds we get from that endowment fund that proceeds will be used for this endowment lecture from the next year it will be in the form of endowment lecture so uh, that is the genesis as i was talking about i will be telling in my duty if i did not tell you about this story so um, uh, we are here to commemorate the late professor in his birth centenary year this is also quite commendable quite uh, uh, I, i think we are privileged we are honored nit durgapur is quite honored because professor chandra has served besides uh, the then ari college at iit kharagpur and also at barwan university so uh, the claims of iit kharagpur and uh, barwan university uh, they have been superseded those claims have been superseded uh, so we are obviously honored and privileged thank you madam and uh, i thank uh, all the delegates who have come here uh, to join this uh, memorial lecture ceremony so um in this ceremony the um, family members the students of professor chandra and uh, the colleagues of professor chandra they will be uh, commemorating their association recollecting their associations with the late professor we are happy that uh, mr suraj chandra professor chandra's son is present here i request mr suraj chandra uh, to come here and uh, share uh, his associations with his father and he was also his teacher because he is also an alumnus of the then ari college thank you varun no uh, but this was not expected you know i mean uh, i didn't get, get even a hint that he would put me in such a situation out, <laughs> out here uh, but anyway mm, good good afternoon and uh, we the family members of professor sm chandra 
as he was normally known, you know, he was never known as Professor S.M. Chondo. He was known as S.M. Janda, I don't know for what reason, but that's how it is. Uh, so we, the family members, have come here today and we consider this to be a privilege, an honor on our part to be able to take part in these centenary proceedings which are being held and uh, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for that, for giving us this opportunity and particularly Dr. Aurindam Modak because he has been instrumental in our coming here as a lot from Delhi and my sister's family from Calcutta. Uh, my sister of course couldn't attend because she is down with a knee replacement surgery and all so she couldn't make it. Nevertheless, uh, yes I am also a, a student of this, ex-student of this college but then that's another story for another day. I mean today it is Dr. S. M. Chanda. My father uh, was a multi faceted personality. He was a great teacher, he was a mentor, a guide for some, a mesmerizing orator and passionate interest in extracurricular activities like uh, quiz, debate and the entire lot you know, the entire lot of extracurricular activities and activities on the on social as well as cultural life of the campus used to be of interest to him. <coughs> but I would say, I still say that the main thing that surpassed all this thing was that he was a good human being. He was a good human being and he, <coughs> he, uh, would stand by you in your hour of need. He, he was ready to travel the extra mile for you. And he was particularly for the students, he was always there. And the students knew it. The students knew it. <coughs> Sorry, I might get a little bit too emotional. Uh, pardon me for that. Uh, see, the fact that he was a friend in need is exemplified today by this function whereby 10 years, more than 10 years, 12 years, 13 years after his passing away, he has been, is being remembered by his students, his ex-colleagues and his friends. That, that's one example that he's remembered. I, even today, even to this day, I get calls from octogenarians living in the USA, settled in the UK, who, who have something to inquire about Dr. S. M. Chandra's past. Why was he so much interested in quiz and debate? Who were his friends in the Calcutta University fraternity? All kinds of questions come pouring into me from different sources, which are 70 years, 80 years old people settled in a different country at the end of their careers and they are still remembering him. When he passed away, uh, his sharp ceremony, uh, Major General of the Indian Army, all decked up, he came, he stood in front of his picture and I could see the tears in his eyes. <coughs> he was obviously saying goodbye to him. So, that, what I want to say is, that's the kind of emotion that he evoked in people. I, I won't continue further, I might break down, you see. So, that's why, thank you very much and uh, God bless you. Thank you, Mr. Chandan. And he was saying that Professor Chandra was a great teacher. So here at uh, the then I College, another teacher was Professor Asuk Sen. And I came to know from Professor Chandra's daughter that Professor Asuk Sen was again Professor Chandra's student at IIT Kharagpur. So you can 
uh, understand, you can know uh, how the great teachers are molded. And there are examples like Dr. Rama Kundu and others, Mandanadi, Sumandha, Sukritida, all of them are present. They are all distinguished teachers. Now I request um, Mrs. Um, Chaitali Chanda, though uh, please. She is Professor Chandra's daughter in law. Namaskar. As usual, I am totally unprepared. This has just been uh, put upon me. Um, of course, I will. I do not know him as a teacher because when I got married, he had just retired. But as a human being, this is what I want to say. Uh, in front of a house in Dwarka, there are a number of shops, little shops, big shops. All those shopkeepers knew him and they really loved him. Because he would reach out to those people also. It was just not the, uh, you know, not the upper gentry or anything of that sort. He would reach out to each and every person. However, big or small he may be, he or she may be, that was his main personality as a human being. He really loved people and people loved him in return. I mean, this is all I can say. Uh, there are lots of stories about him which I would, maybe some other day I would uh, love to relate. but. We can continue with others, maybe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Chaitalishan Chandra. Now, there are three granddaughters of Professor Chandra who are present here. We are very happy. In fact, how they found their grandfather. So, I would like to call them one by one, Upala Sen. Should be played first. Uh, what do you think? If it's loud enough. So, Professor Chandu's daughter, uh, Mrs. Sulekha Sen, Riniti, she could not come, uh, but she has sent a message. They want to play that message first, so it is recorded, it will be played. Please listen to it. I extend my sincerest thanks to the NIT authorities, Dr. Orinda Mudu and Dr. Rama Kudu for taking the initiative to organize the Isim Chakra Memorial Lecture in memory of my father, Prof. Shuti Mohan Chakra. My father taught at this institution from 1961 to 1985. Simultaneously, also taught once a week at Birdman University. And before that,
in that town. Nana was my brother's name. So Baba's popularity among students was so much common knowledge. However, that did not mean Baba pandered to the students or was lenient in matters of study. One student told me he had missed several successive classes of my father because they were in the early hours of the morning. One morning, as he was brushing his teeth, he was shocked to see my father marching into the room with the entire class. Baba came up to him and said, if Mahomet won't come to the mountain, the mountain will come to him. There was no censure, no review, just a firm and humiliated inclusive embrace. It was my father who started the quiz contests, intercollegiate debates, and English one and two competitions in this institution. He contributed to innumerable journals within the country and also overseas. And he wrote very frequently in the Statesman, which was then a very prestigious newspaper and the only English one. Baba also gave talks over the radio, touching topics of English literature and language. English was his passion. Towards the end, when he was in the nursing home, an ex-student who came to see him said, we used to say Professor Chandu even dreams in English. When my father passed away in 2010, a hard-nosed corporate gentleman, gentleman, very unacademic, very practical, commented, he was like a flower. This was a very apt description. Baba was totally unsullied by any pettiness. He loved life in simple things and turned everything into an experience of joy. When the first misty autumn clouds appeared in the sky, he would sit in the veranda every year and burst into the song. Even now, when autumn approaches, it means to me Baba breaking forth into his joyous song. When he was walking down from college, and if any of us stood there in the veranda, he would wave his hands vigorously and smile warmly, as though he was seeing us after months, and not just a few hours. When he went marketing and got down for a cup of tea by the roadside stalls, he would always, always, hand one bar of tea to his rickshawala and say, to me you come. of 
small and big dictionaries. The open almirah in his bedroom contained rows of diaries from the time my mother was born and before that, and he had scribbled something or the other in each one of them, not orphan entries, mind you. Every jotting was against a particular date. You would imagine from these things that he was a creature of routine, but you had to know him to believe that routine existence could be embraced with such grand anticipation. I have put down a couple of things, but these are mostly from his post-retirement years, which is basically the chunk of my memory of him. So mid-morning, there was a coffee break, which he savored with my grandmother every day. Around noon, he plucked flowers for her puja. Evenings, he went out for a walk, giant torch in hand. And when he read a book, whenever he read a book, he first put a newspaper cover on. We lived in Bandel, and whenever he came, it was festival hour. He made an occasion of the simplest of things. Those few days, our mornings tasted like hot jalebis he fetched from the market, and the evenings were soft and dreamy like the cream rolls they had brought along from Durgapur. We gorged day and night on stories of his student days in Dhaka, when the comedian Bhanu was a classmate. Of his early youth in Calcutta, his dog Donny of Independence Night. He would recount anecdotes about Niro Chaudhuri and Humayun Kabir. Though I must admit, I had no idea who these characters were. And when he got really sleepy, he would mix up one story with another and not be able to complete either thread, making me and my sister and our grandmother dissolve into giggles. His loud sneeze would make our pet dog, the very ferocious Pico, jump out of her skin, and that made us laugh even more. But the happiest person those days was possibly our mother, the two of them debating over all kinds of things, so utterly happy yet disagreeing. And just when I thought Durgapur and his students were farthest from his mind, they would claim him. I came to understand even as a child that his students, their lessons, and his scheduled time with them were non-negotiable. Being back in Durgapur unlocks so many memories. Dadu and me walking in the dark and stopping to read a poster for an upcoming circus. This is just where the peerless hotel is now. Then the sight of him entering the gate of his beloved address, P36 Recall Park, with a bunch of leeches in his hand. The sight of him on his bicycle, which could have been a chariot. Once I had flown the nest to study abroad, it was from an internet cafe in Durgapur that he wrote me his first email. And he, this is one line I remember. With this, I break the email ice, it read. Uh, I remember his lined copy of James Singh's Riders to the Sea, and I can still hear his voice recite the verse from Treasure Island for the hundredth time. Fifteen men on a dead man's chest, dead man's chest, yo ho ho, and a bottle of rum. And you wouldn't be able to tell that he was a teetotaler and had no idea what the spirit tasted like. And there was this thing he would do when we were children and even when we were all grown up, he would gather me and my sister in his arms and sing out loud uh, and tunelessly, Amra Shobhu Jamra Notun. Dr. S. N. Chondo, my grandfather, Dadu, was an evergreen person. Thank you everyone associated with this event for watering his memory. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Pula. Now I request Pia. Please come here. Thank you, uh, Orinanda, and thank you to the department. Uh,
for this privilege of being able to speak to the other students and, and address his beloved institution. Um, so stories about my grandfather, as you have gathered, are many. And uh, especially since he is so much a part of our conversations at home every day, that uh, it is very easy to almost effortlessly recount. You know, almost like fables are passed on from one person to another. And um, I thought since you will hear so many stories, I wanted to remember my grandfather, but not just from a point of recounting, but also a point of reflection something which has grown with time since his passing. Um, so for as long as I can remember, my grandfather would be surrounded by students. Um, when I was very small and we would come all the way from Bandar to uh, Dungapur, we reached Recall Park by mid-morning and uh, upon entering, his classes would be on. And I then thought it was a very intimidating gaggle of students sitting all around him in the drawing room. And even if the students were not present, not around physically, they made their presence felt materially. So the sideboard in Recall Park it was lined with greeting cards. Almost all of them said to serve with love and uh, Teacher's Day gifts. And I used to read the inscriptions with great interest in the afternoons. And uh, there was one set of letters I remember from a former student all the way from America, which really thrilled me. Matthew Daniel, I think maybe my uncle would remember Matthew Daniel. And uh, to put it in context, it was the early 90s, and American boy bands were like the stuff of school fantasies in Calcutta. So it, it amazed me that my grandfather had never been to the US, but he had a reach all the way from Durgapur right into the heart of Oklahoma, uh, which I only knew from teen magazines or cassette covers. Um, there was that. Um, but there were also other sides to Dadu. And um, so one was he had something of the presence of a horde in himself, you know. Uh, he was very joyous. He spoke with emphasis. He had certain set expressions. He would say, good God. Good Lord, uh, you know, very emphatically. And he had this quality. So uh, we would travel from Bandar, take the Coalfield or uh, Coalfield or Shatadi, I think, 26 January mornings for his birthday. And uh, the air was crackling with birthday excitement. And Dano must have been then in his 70s. And he was so uninhibited. He contributed to his own birthday excitement. You know, and there was not too much to market, like balloons, maybe a sweater, or my grandmother would make polao. But that was it. But Dada would be exclaiming all over the place, you know, just happy that we were excited. Um, to us, as grandchildren, I think his academic identity was not different from his, uh, I mean, maybe my sister was older, my cousins were far younger, but I always thought my grandfather Professor S. M. Chondo, IIT Kharagpur, IIT College Durgapur, Dhaka University, all in one place. Not implied that other. It was an assemblage for me. Um, and so, like I say, his academic presence, identity was not different from his personal one. So this one anecdote: he had. Um, I was in class, I think four. So he had a table clock, a talking clock, which somebody must have given him. Um, and uh, it would announce the time if you just pressed a button. I did not know that. So Dadu told me in the morning, only if you ask it the time in correct English, mind you, with a proper cadence, pronounce the words properly, will it tell you the time. So all morning he was actually pressing the button. I didn't know that. In the afternoon, when everyone was asleep, I can you imagine, I was probably seven or eight, I kept pressing the, like, I kept asking the clock, I kept rephrasing my question, could you please tell me the time? And I was not even sure which words were not being done correctly. And so I think unwittingly that also deepened my very conflicted relationship with literature at that point in time. Um, I didn't study literature, I, I went over to the other side, sociology. And um, uh, so this was that. There was a time when, um, when my mother would teach me grammar. Uh, she would call Dadu. So it was all things English, not just literature, you know. And uh, they would, I think I was being taught gerunds and participles. And 
They started off nicely, but then it ended into this heated argument about which was which, which was a gerund, which was not. Um, later, I think, um, when I was in college, I thought this world of English literature, which my grandfather literally owned, uh, was something I could profit from. So that I used to say a lot of quotes in certain contexts. So one was, I think this is yes, the center cannot hold, things are falling apart. And why it sounds so attractive when he delivers it like that. So I used to use it for all my sociology essays and social movements. Um, yeah, the professorial identity seeping in in his personal life. So like my sister was saying, every, you know, every letter, every card would be signed Professor S. F. Chandu, never Dadu. So we had a dog, and when she turned one for her birthday, Dadu sent a greeting card with a very complicated English message signed from Latika Chandu, my grandmother, and S. M. Chandu. And I was so thrilled that he had acknowledged the seriousness of a non-human, you know, family member's birthday. It says something about him as a person. When I started teaching, it was almost like there was a template in place for me. Uh, I think the first year, my grandmother asked me very carefully, do you sit when you give lectures? Or, uh, and I knew she, she was implying that Dadu never sat. He walked when he taught. And uh, I should probably do the same if I wanted to step in his shoes. There was no question of a parallel at all. Um, but mind you, he was not, he was not a detached scholarly figure, uh, like the usual tropes you think of when you think of academics. He felt so much. And um, this is when he's in his 80s. I was in university in Delhi, and he came all the way from Dwarka to CR Park in a very shaky auto, the stormy Delhi evening, to see me for 10 minutes. And only because on the phone I told him I was feeling low. He was far, far from detached. Uh, not as a grandfather, not even as a teacher. Yeah. And um, so the other thing, comparisons always came up. Uh, I always thought he inhabited a very different academic world than the one I came into. But that's also because the times were different, right? Um, so my mother always reminds me, she still does, that Dadu always, he sat at his secretarial table every day. He covered his teaching notes, teaching cards with notes every day. And um, you know, when I started teaching, or even now, I would probably, in the middle of a weekday, I would talk on the phone or watch something. And it doesn't really go down well, because the template is such a dominant one. I'm always reminded that, uh, you know, you should, you should do how uh, he did things. And um, I wanted to sort of end on this note that, um, and here it comes to my reflection, that for a very long time, I have seen my grandfather, heard what his students say, heard what his children say, his very adoring family. Uh, even my grandmother was very adoring of him. And I always thought that it was my grandfather's innate qualities which drew students to him. I also thought that maybe the academia that he inhabited was a very different space. It was a different time. It was very idyllic. Certain things were possible. But over the years, when I feel somewhat battle-worn myself, and I've been listening to some of the students today, Professor Jana, Professor Koshan, talking about my grandfather, I also feel a great discomfort with the way I have largely regarded him. You know, certain labels we apply very well-meaningly, like charismatic or student-friendly for a popular teacher, it takes away something from the actions, from the resolve of the, of the person doing it. And uh, looking back, I think, to have made such inroads in the lives of students in an engineering college as a professor of English, it tells you so much about not just student friendliness or love for the discipline, but also a resolve, intentions to do academics, to do life in a certain way. You know, I, I, I want to end on this note with this reflection, just to show that I don't think about my grandfather just in terms of stories or what I've seen or heard, but that he is part of my everyday reflections even now. Thank you.
Um, sorry, your clap is a little premature. Just one thing I wanted to add. Um, you know, when I was a PhD scholar years ago in Germany, I came across this woman, this young woman from Durgapur, who said she had never had a single inspiring professorial figure in her life, but there was this gentleman she took tuitions from, a professor S.M. Chando. Uh, you know, she now teaches in Aberdeen. And when she saw the post on social media, which I had shared of Aurangabad's poster, she wrote back saying, and she must have known my grandfather when he was already 75, 76. She wrote back saying, I'm sorry, my internet isn't working. She said, here, I have to tell you this now. I remember your grandparents' drawing room, but I had such a crush on your grandfather. The way he talked, the way he was, and I would never miss tuition. Um, I thought it was, you know, about just, I want to end on that note. He was always so joyous. It's a good thing to remember him in joy. Um, thank you very much again. Thank you, Ia. I forgot to tell you that um, Ia has been teaching at President's University, Kolkata, Sociology. She is a sociology professor. And uh, Upala, she is in journalism. Uh, she regularly writes research based articles in the Telegraph. So now I request Sulagna Tango, please come here. And share your recollection of your grandfather. Um, as I'm prepared, uh, as both my parents were, it seems. So, some things are genetic. But uh, thank you so much for having us here, for organizing this for Dabu. Thank you, Dr. Ramakondu. Thank you, Arvinda, for really having us all together and having this lecture today. Um, I didn't have the good fortune of knowing Dadu as a professor. For me, it was always Dabu, and it really is a minus in life. Um, sorry. The stories I hear growing up, the stories I hear of Dadu as a professor growing up, um, it's certainly going to encapsulate more than my life. So it, yeah, like I said, it's definitely my mess in life. Um, however, I knew him as Dadu, and that was pretty great too. He, um, he's all of the things I've never really found myself agreeing so vehemently with everything Ishi said, with everything Dula Devi said, with everything Hiya Devi said, with everything my father, my mom said, he truly was one man who could be all of those things and so much more. For me, Dadu was at once this figure of so much joy, but also um, I think I spent a lot of my childhood really arguing with Dadu because he would cheat at Ludo. Uh, he would cheat. Uh, at everything. He would cheat at all games. Uh, Durgapur was notorious at that time for uh, electricity issues and every time the electricity went was Dadu's field day because he would surprisingly win all games that he had so far been losing. Um, so <laughs> that is um, one part. Um, also another part of Dadu is uh, there, there was a small uh, Chai Tokan right outside next to the stadium. Uh, and I was telling Ma Baba yesterday that he put up a poster for uh, someone who was selling a fridge and he put up a poster with their number and the fridge uh, spelling was wrong. Uh, Dadu was buying Fantu and Chai um, and he pointed out that, uh, you know, fridge is one So, uh, this man was telling Dadu, Jirna, you don't know, I have checked uh, with this person in my colony, he knows very good English, he's really good at it, I have checked with him, 
uh, you don't know, you are wrong. It, it was some freeze or something. Dadu continued for a while. He also wasn't one to let it go. Uh, he continued for a while and uh, unfortunately for him was defeated in this battle of whether a refrigerator short form is called freeze or fridge. Uh, and I thought uh, it was particularly interesting because and especially since I've been hearing everyone speak about him. Um, humility is the mark of a really great person. For him to lose, to have the legacy and to be on the board as a legendary professor remembered as one, having headed a department of English for so long, for him to lose and say that, okay, Maybe you are right, maybe I don't know, and maybe your fridge is felt as peace is also the mark of a great human being, the mark of someone who knew when to let go, and you know, even if that meant might take humble by himself. Um, I also knew Dadu as this silhouette who would regularly streak across in the uh, evening dim light uh, for his umpteenth cup of chai uh, from the, there was this small chai dukan right in front of our house and I would invariably on my way back from college if, every time I'd get late I would see this shadowy figure crossing the road with great stealth and uh, going to you know dissolving into the chai tapri and no one stopped him mind you uh, no one said he couldn't drink cha. Uh, it is my great privilege and honor to be given this chance to pay my respects to esteemed Professor Shijit Mohan Chandra. I convey my heartfelt gratitude and thanks to the organizers of today's event in commemoration of a wonderful teacher and a no less wonderful person. I also particularly thank Dr. Arindam Modak, a former pupil of mine, for the admirable initiative he has taken in this regard. Professor Chandra's favorite book was Breath waves to serve with love. Today's event is our tribute to serve with love. Yes. Love and respect and nostalgia for the days that will never, never come back. I gratefully take this chance to say just a few words through crowd, though crowded memories try to just win. Yes, indeed, he was extraordinary. Professor S. M. Chandra, he was so much to so many people around him. We have just listened to his family people, but also we know how others felt about him. And people who have been lucky enough to come in close contact with him. He was wonderful to everybody around. Near ones as well as not so near ones. I remember Katima, his wife, saying once, Rama, I cannot recall a single instance when he spoke harshly to me. This was after more than a half century of conjugal life, just before his death. Amazing, he would be ever so soft, so kind, so considerate to family, friends, and pupils, and was always ready to go miles for them. Yes, he was upright, dignified, decent, ever committed to his values of dignity and freedom, but never harsh, never rough or rude. This indicated an exceptional inner strength and standard which he had set himself. 
a standard dictated by the values of swiftness and light and culture, as opposed to barbarism, illustrism, anarchy, to speak in Arnoldian terms. As teacher, Professor Chandu was a legend for students of our times, smilingly, without any accessories like video, powerpoints, etc., etc., not even a microphone always. He would conjure up a scene from a text, or sometimes an entire text, holding his audience enthralled hour after hour, as the text came alive through his sharp and sensitive exploration. We sat spellbound, is like listeners to Mozart's magic flute. Those were memorable experiences. Unfortunately, technology was not so much in the air those days. So there is perhaps no audio record, video recording or the like. Whatever is there is remaining just etched in our memory. Yes. He was a great teacher and an exceptional person. Many present here may not have seen or known him personally. But I had been fortunate enough to know him personally as a postgraduate student and later on as a pupil with Sarah's supervisor for my PhD work. And thenceforth, my lifelong guide, my mentor. With his modern orientation and openness, his ambience, frankness, charming personality, Professor Chandra as a teacher was naturally very popular with his young students. <coughs> At the same time, he was an unfailingly affectionate and supportive father figure, always ready to encourage and to actively help them as the occasion demanded, which sometimes involved this as well. But he did not bother. I came to know this from my own personal experience. During a crisis, he stood by me like a rock. Whatever I could do and be subsequently had its beginning here. I can never adequately put in words what he did for me. As a teacher, I was inimitable in some ways. As an individual, he was a daring, open, upright person. He could not compromise with his values. Such a man is bound to suffer in, his, in this hard world of mediocrity and calculation. And he too had had to suffer. But he did not fit. He would absorb injuries and loss with dignity and go ahead with head held high. The value of individual dignity and human freedom was such a deeply held conviction. It was at his feet that I first came to learn about Zaviati, Kessler and others, unflinching fight for these values. <coughs> Sir himself was a reputed <coughs> oral expert. <coughs> Allow me to read out <coughs> The concluding paragraph of the preface <coughs> to my forthcoming book in press at the moment titled Candles in the Wind. <coughs> it is a study of some authors who dared the state power and thus came to represent a <coughs> of lone descent. <coughs> I quote from this thesis of mine, quote, lastly, I take this opportunity to pay my humble tribute <coughs> to late Professor Sujit Mohan Chanda, my teacher in the university and my research guide, an eminent oral scholar himself, who inspired and instilled in some of his pupils at least, alongside literary perception and aesthetic sensibility, the values of dissent and freedom, of truth and dignity, through his enthralling classroom lectures on fiction in general and on dystopian fiction in particular during the late 60s. Thank you, sir, for those memorable vernal showers 
over that fair sick time of the soul of your fortunate students. And finally, thank you, sir, for everything. An open-minded, rational, modern man as he was, sir, embodied for us the best of modern values and culture. At the same time, he was deeply emotional at the court. After visiting Bangladesh in the late 60s, in the late 90s, Sir had been very keen about this quite some time, about this proposed visit. He told me how he had traced back the spot where his father's last rites had been performed decades ago, when he was a young man. There he would touch the ground and say aloud, Baba, Ei tomar shanki amar shesh dekkar, Baba. This is my last meet with you here on this holy ground in this of this college, once trod by sir every day, daily. Let me whisper humbly, gratefully, sir. But this is my last meet with you. Let me kneel to thee in one final salutation in one final salutation. Never beating her own drums. 
and yet a luminary by her own greatness, by her own struggle with time and, you know, adversities. Professor Kundu has asked me, uh, a silly fellow, a poor fellow, what a great amount of kindness that emulates Professor Asmussen. Thank you. During his stay at Ayal College, the Dijin Ayal College, <coughs> Professor Chandu had dared to publish journal from the department. So some copies of the journal are there for display. Students, I think, have already visited the display section where uh, three copies of the journals are there, published from Department of Humanities, Ayal College, and. He also used to write in the statesman regularly and I think he started working with the statesman first. Then he went to IIT Kharagpur. Isn't it Tranada? He was actually with St. Paul's for a while in okay. Calcutta yes. and Hooghly Motion College in Hooghly. Mm -hmm. And thereafter... Uh, and Panam. Before that Panam. Panam was his first job. Panam okay. 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 I see. Then went to IIT Kharagpur. From IIT Kharagpur, he came to Ari College. So it was not the institute that mattered. It was the passion for teaching that mattered more for him. And he went to Barwan University every week. Uh, so you can understand the passion for literature. Uh, what it was to Professor Chandra. Now I request uh, Mrs. Sushitra Kaur. She is Bulbanna. Take it as you wish, I will not criticize. So, Professor Chandra had one student at the Indian Ali College, the Archfile Ali College, who was Menon. He has sent a message, I will read it out. Uh, I would like to share, uh, Mr. Menon writes, and he is now the managing director, CEO, and co founder of Pelatro. Mr. Menon writes, I would like to share the following experience I had with Professor Chandon. I used to participate in elocution competition and was quite fascinated about it from the ages of, age of five. I was quite good at it and had won the first prize several times. In RECD, during my second year, I won the first prize and represented our college in the intercollegiate competition. In short, participating and winning in elocution competition was very really important for me. During my third year, I once again participated in the competition. Professor Chando had taught, uh, taught us English in the initial semesters and was one of the judges at the competition. Although I had done my best and even managed to clock exactly 3 minutes and 0 seconds during the delivery, I did not win the first prize. Quite naturally, I was crestfallen. The next day, he called me to his office and the following conversation took place. Professor saying, I noticed that uh, you were quite sad with the results of yesterday's competition. Do you believe that you had done your best? And me saying, yes. Professor said, uh, Subhas, our duty in life is to do the best and take the result with a smile, irrespective of what the result is. If you are self-confident and keep doing your best, you will be a winner in life. And it does not matter how many times you fall, make sure you get up every time. You are a talented speaker and not winning once, uh, not winning one prize will not make you any less an orator. I did not know 
that he had noticed me as a student. I had no idea that he had observed me when the results were announced. Yet he had done all of that and took it upon himself to guide a young and immature boy. That to me was the greatness of Professor Chandra. That interaction has remained fresh in my life and formed the foundation of my philosophy about life and approach to the same. Truly, Professor Chandra, with such a short interaction of a few minutes, managed to change my life beyond imagination. A great teacher and a great man. That was uh, Suhas Menon, Mr. Suhas Menon, writing for this event. So, now I request Dr. Kamala Banerjee, Professor Chandu's colleague. I request Madam to share her association with Professor Chandu. Yeah. 
appropriate. If you wanted to change the word in that sentence, you would fail. So that was the most appropriate word that had to be fixed. Then in Bengali, most of the communication between us took place in English. But now and then, sometimes, he used Bengali. And the interesting point is, uh, in Hindi, you have the short words, tum, aap. In Bengali, we have tumi, apni. But in English, you have you. Why you, you, that's all. That's the interesting part, and now listen. So, whenever I entered his room, I never took the liberty of sitting down on the vacant chair there. I kept standing, discussed, and came off. One day, he was busy with something, and then I was still standing. He noticed it. And do you know what he told me? Be English or Bengali? He said, Boste mana ne. You are not forbidden to sit. So, in other words, please sit. So I thanked him and sat on the chair and waited for my turn to discuss with him. <coughs> Another point was, I'll come to this later. He, he had a scholastic mind and many of the authors, the people, previous speakers narrated, where he was very superb in his selection of books, like George Bernard Shaw, George Orwell, Dickens, Brett Wett, A.G. Wells, and so on and so forth. Now, he was a person who started drawing the attention of the students to science fiction. Because after all, you cannot deny the fact they are here not to study literature. They have come here primarily to study engineering. But then, in life, they cannot or will not be able to manage things for themselves if they neglect the English language. So what happened, you know? Um, just a sec, please. And uh, these writers were there. Now, and whenever we met in the first few months, he told me that, remember, we are having semester system and not university exam after two years. So semester system is a very tight schedule and you have to make it uh, sure, you have to be sure about it that you will finish your syllabus within the stipulated time. And it went on like that and I never felt any problem because if the students are there, I am also there. One day when I went for the class with the register, the duster, the chalk in hand, I was waiting outside the door for the teacher to come out so that I can join the students. Believe me or not, I stood and I stood, I stood and I stood. After long 40 minutes, somebody opened the door, looked at me, was dumbfounded and left the place. I didn't say, he was a physics professor. Okay, so what could I do? He has already consumed 40 minutes out of the 60 minutes. So I entered the class and I taught them what I could. When I came back, I went to Dr. Chando and again he started saying, Mrs. Banerjee, be very particular about the time. You see, if you don't finish the syllabus, it will be difficult for us to set the questions. I said, of course, sir, I am doing what you are asking me to do, but just tell me how much can I teach when 40 minutes out of the precious 60 minutes is taken away by somebody else. Then he said, yes, that gentleman had reported to me and extended his apologies for the mistake. And that is how life went on. Life was very interesting with exams, with students writing. Now, after the exams were over, we got the scripts to, to check them out. And there was a bunch of papers which I sorted out from the rest. And believe me, I really developed a headache because I wasn't able to understand the head or tail of what they had written. So I took all those papers to Dr. John and I told him, asked him, Sir, how much do I allot for these papers? Then he said, he had a look and he said, uh, give them the pass marks. Then I said, Sir, on what basis do I give them the marks? There has to be a basis. 
either it's good quality writing or some special feature details. But you are asking me, yes, give them. What is the script they have used? Roman script. So they have used the Roman script, so give them the full mark. So that is how life went on. And those students about whom I am mentioning, loved me, and I too loved them because they were so pretty junior and life was not very kind to them. They were from Palestine and whenever the war was breaking out, I used to call them, ask them about their parents and I loved those boys. But then the point is exam is an exam. You don't know where you are studying, where you will be working, where you will be posted and what is the medium of communication. English definitely stands. Uh, on strong grounds in that is hmm. when you came to this room there is a collapsible gate here have you noticed it or not just just go a little bit and if I so when Dr. Chomri used to come from that end and I used to walk down from this end near the collapsible gate the space wasn't much so I stood aside and showed my hands to him. He stood aside and showed his hands to me. <laughs> and for two, three minutes it went on. And then he said, ladies first. And I told him, seniors first. <laughs> so that is how things will you know. But let me tell you one thing. I failed. I failed to uh, drive or walk away before me. He did not. He didn't put an age. He said, no, I'll not move out. You have to go ladies first. <laughs> so everything was wonderful. You know, life has its joy and sorrows. Ah, this is a very interesting. He was a master of science fiction. Yes, that's many of us will love to read it. But what happened, you know, uh, along with belief in science fiction, there was something of conventional superstition, which he believed. And how he believed, let me narrate it to you. It's very beautiful. Uh, one day, in the post-lunch session, I found Dr. Chongyo sitting in, not in his room, but in some other room in this corridor. Okay, fine. So I stood outside and I didn't enter, and then I was listening to what was going on in the room. And Dr. Chandra seemed to be very perturbed, very concerned. I, then I gathered from other people that he had lost his bunch of keys. And keys means how vital they are, you know, for yourself. It had the uh, department key, the uh, key of the steel and myra, and so on and so forth. After listening for some time, Everybody was there, our department members. I did not hesitate. I told him, sir, you teach science fiction, but this is also life. So can I give some suggestions? He said, yes, come on. So I said, you know, my mother-in-law had actually done this with me before. So what happened? I had lost something precious. And I told my mother-in-law, ma, I have lost this, so what do I do about it? Then she said that she took the name of a particular Hindu god and said, You pray to him, and when you find the thing, you have to perform a little ritual at the door frame of the puja room. Okay, fine. Then uh, I did it and I could find back my lost item. So that was. So I told Dr. Chandan, you have to do all this. He said, yes, I will do it. And everybody was taken aback that such a smart person, bold, powerful, everything under his control. And yet, he is succumbing to this. But life offers no choice, you know. So you have to do it. You have to do it. And then the next morning, this is more interesting. Next morning when I come to the department, I find him on his chair with the door ajar and he is sitting in a bed. Then I said, sir, things, uh, what's the news? He said, do you know, when I left the call, I walked out of the room, had shifted to his uh, recall park home that time. And so he said, as I crossed the road, I went to the shop where I normally go. 
and gives for you to guess what shop it should be. So there he finds, he tells the man, have you a bunch of keys left here by somebody? The man kept his lips tight, just opened the drawer, fetched the keys, bunch and gave it to him. So he went back gleefully telling his wife of Mrs. Chondo, see, here it is. And then she said, she heard the whole story. She was not told earlier a word about this happening. And then what happened? Uh, she said, yes, I have understood what you want to explain. But remember, you have to offer something to the God to appease, appease him. So, have your bath, wear fresh clothes, as is the custom with us, you go and do. So, this is what he did. He, 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 and we were all laughing that person outwardly, above everything, is also bound by some rituals at some point of their life. Hmm. Towards the end of his working days here, once I was coming back from the ground floor taking a class, I found a group of men, uh, gentlemen, sorry, who were standing before the door of Dr. Chandra's room and Dr. Chandra was encouraging them to go around and see the college, etc. They, they were actually members of a team who were visiting the college prior to the changeover to uh, NIT. So he introduced me and do you know, before I say what he said about me, I would say that I bow my head to this great soul who really spoke something so nice about me. He said, meet Mrs. Banerjee, 24 karat gold. And I said, what use is 24 karat gold, sir? You can't make ornaments out of it. <laughs> he still lives. He continues to us. And as great poets have already said, parents continue through their children. And we have seen the beautiful children of Dr. Chandra's family. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam, for sharing those beautiful incidents. So, uh, here we have with us Dr. Suman Jana, one of the uh, most illustrious uh, and uh, favorite students of Dr. Chandra. Dr. Chandra loved him and he also loved Dr. Chandra very much. So, I request Dr. Suman Jana to share his association. Good evening, everybody. Um, there is a limit to audacity after Professor Rama Kundu, um, who is my teacher, um, who is placed by me, uh, by a pretty mischievous fellow like me, on a very high pedestal. I am not going to take my time, number one, uh, in courtesy. Uh, I have so many things to say about Professor Chandra that it will take at least one hour, so I am not going to take any time at all. Not only really that, tonight I'll have to catch a train over at some mill at 8, 10 p.m. And I have a class tomorrow at the Institute of Engineering, uh, Electrical Engineering, um, uh, who are conducting a refresher course in BHU, so I'll be taking the train. So the main speaker, main attraction is over, Ramadi. And uh, another very great attraction is going to come, Shukriti, one of the most punctilious scholars uh, I have come across in recent times. He's my junior, but I, I respect him. One, only one episode out of my life where he practically um, slapped me with my shoe, with his shoes. Yes, <laughs> just one episode. He called me to come on one occasion on a certain, let us say, Tuesday or Saturday or whatever it is, to get out of the book, which he would, uh, you know, be very kind enough to carry from Dudapur to Bhattan. And I used to stay uh, within the camp.
campus. And uh, my uh, mother's younger sister died, my Mashi, on the early evening. And I, being the eldest son of my mother, uh, I was debuted with the task of going and uh, being present, etc., etc., etc. So I just couldn't make up. And I, I didn't even dare to tell my father that um, Sar was um, supposed to, I was supposed to meet Sar and let him. Fine. So he came. He came with his book. And I came back um, very late in the evening um, after the cremation and all went over at Karatala. And the first thing I noticed was that on, on our dining table, a book called Adventures of Augie March uh, was just like, and it was not a very new one, and it was those, you know, those days it was the, the penguin editions were not as glossy and as attractive as today they are. So somehow it was a penguin edition. I just you know, immediately caught my eyes, I opened and I found this read, S. M. Chatham, written on it. So it's his book. Uh, I was stunned, I was stunned that I had, had it come over to our house. Then my father, well, after having my bath and all that, you know these uh, rituals are there that you come from crematorio and you have to at least take a bath. Okay, alright. So, um, after I got ready, refreshed, my father said, Fujit Babu had come upstairs, I couldn't believe, you know, even in those, those days, there was a kind of hierarchy. Fujit Babu was nine years senior to my father. He went upstairs. He learned from somebody that I am his son. I didn't tell him that uh, my father was a professor of the university. Why um, Then to cut everything short, Fujit Babu found him up. Found him up and said, someone was supposed to come. He is not usually callous. So anyway, he must be safe. You please take this book home and tell him uh, that Sarah had given it to him with love. Uh, my father said, uh, was he supposed to come? Yes, but I didn't know. Uh, <coughs> my sister-in-law had died and I sent him. Uh, I could have easily stupid fellow. I could have easily sent him in the afternoon uh, after the cremation was over. It was a question of you know, our family presence. No, 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 no it's alright. It's alright. Don't tell him anything. So my father says, said that he was humbled that a nine-year-old senior professor climbed up the second floor of the old humanities building, found my father out, never having met him before, in glad to people who were his doctors and handed over to him so that I do not waste that time for a single day or a single week uh, so that the thing could be handed over. Next week I went and uh, saw him. Just one more minute, please, Shukriti. Um, next week, a uh, week when I went over there and saw him without my book and said that, sir, I'm nearly through. Um, he he uh, opened his briefcase and he brought out her sock, H-E-R-Z-O-D, G, most of you have heard of her sock, this one. He said, you haven't yet finished. Then he kept drumming for around 10, 20, maybe 30 seconds, I don't remember. Uh, then very ungladly, and that was the first time I found him a little discontent with me. He said, Bangalore, first in Bengali, and then I'll narrate in English in case there are, uh, you know, across these are Indian students, so there are, must be many from outside the state. What normally everyone can do, so you can also do it easily. What nobody can do, you have to do. So don't ever waste your time. Anyway, I hope that by 
in the next week, he will be with God. I was not supposed to be his scholar. He was just preparing me with Solvel so that I could pres present, you know, to the university to the board of research studies that this is my uh, you know, uh, suggestion or proposal for PhD. Uh, by by which time my results have come. Um, so that was a, the, one of the worst claps of, on my face ever. And trust me, um, he lives in me. He's not dead. He lives in me. And when he died, a lot of people, a lot of my parents said that they are sorry. They are very sad. I was not sorry because I, I was carrying the spirit, not the blood. And in India, we say that two things. Two things exist. One is the family tree with the Vongsho, and another, and, I mean, the Vongsho, and another is with the Vongsho. I am a child of Sars with the Vongsho, and I am proud to say that over 41 years I have been telling something or the other about Professor S. M. Chanda to my students, who all know how how he could, you know, he could he could he could make out, you know, with with the twist of his uh, fingers that, that a butterfly, uh, that a caterpillar wriggling out and then bursting into a butterfly uh, in relation to stain, when he explained stain to us, he used to do uh, Lord Jim with us and he used to do it like this. So, you know, this is the thing, how to make things visualize. You know, this is, I think this is the most important part, that you visualize something which had happened um, through a verbal medium which cannot be appreciated by the others. So, thank you very much. And I believe um, next time I'll be alive and I'll, I'll be uh, granted at least 30 minutes time. So I have so many, so many anecdotes of respect and uh, of wisdom um, from which all of us can learn, anybody, anybody, anybody. Because I firmly believe that if somebody is immortal, nobody has been ever immortal in life just by virtue of learning or by teaching. Give me one example. Um, no, you won't find Einstein, no, Einstein, you know, by his intuition, click. So uh, Einstein was a, was, was a kind of result of maybe 100 failures. Um, so many people had tried before him and uh, you know, it was a process, uh, but only those who live and has lived in history has lived by now. And Professor Chanda, um, I haven't found anybody of any political culture, of any culture, of any creed, of any kind of fundamental belief disliking him and not loving him. So he will stay. I, I feel blessed that I am here today. Thank you. Um, Shukriti, I would very uh, humbly with hold that and request you to um, you know, finish up by five so that at least I can catch you on my train. <laughs> Uh, yes, but anyway, you know, if you don't invite me, I'll, I'll remind you to invite me. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Tapan Kumar Mukherjee, another student of Professor Chandu, he has sent a uh, message and I will read his message. I am glad to learn that. <coughs> Sorry, HSS Department of NIT Singapore has decided to organize a program commemorating the birth centenary of our teacher, Professor S. M. Chandra. This year marks the, the hundred years of his birth. I am grateful to the NIT authority and especially to Professor Arindam Mudok, HSS Department, for the opportunity accorded to me to record my reflections on this auspicious occasion and thereby pay my respectful homage to our teacher. We are here to commemorate the life and achievement of an outstanding professor, a distinguished scholar, and exhilarating friend, philosopher, and guide to many. 
In his eventful life, he belonged to so many institutions, engaged in so many activities, and enlivened human existence for so many people, that it is not possible in one afternoon to do justice to all his talents and achievements. Though we can convey our love, affection, and admiration, which he inspired to successive generations of students, a few familiar facts of his life may be in order here to arrive at a general impression of the man. So he, uh, after his stint at IIT Kharagpur for nearly 10 years, he came to Dugapur and was appointed to an identical post as Professor of Humanities when REC, the previous incarnation of NIT, was established in 1960s. He <coughs> sorry, stayed there until his retirement on superannuation. Although the academic community had to pass through a troubled time and painful ordeal during the period of Naxal movement, he was an immensely successful and popular teacher both here and at Bardwan University Postgraduate Department of English where he was a part-time lecturer. He obtained a field degree from Calcutta University for his doctoral dissertation on the novels of George Orwell written under the supervision of Dr. Amalindu Bosch. His thesis on George Orwell was well received in academic circle, critically acclaimed and discussed in summary, in summary form in the peer-reviewed journal Modern Fiction Studies from Purdue University. He also published a book on the novels of E.M. Forster. The copy is here on display. He could instill into the mind of the students a sense of excitement and thrill of reading and enjoying novel through nuanced study and subtle analysis of the, of the inner workings of the characters and the impact of their immediate environment in which they move. He was a regular contributor to the statesman newspaper mainly on the various aspects of engineer's English. Apart from his academic achievements and regular teaching assignments, posterity will remember him as a very fine organizer and coordinator of debate and quiz competition in inter-college competition. He had been uh, he, uh, a keen interest in a variety of intellectual pursuits apart from his own discipline. We used to attend his enthralling lectures on English fiction on Saturdays week after week and we could not afford to miss any of his classes as such, such as his charismatic personality and mode of delivering his lectures. So we thank Mr. Tapun Kuan Mukherjee. He uh, was a student of Professor Chandu and worked with the Yuko Bank for sending this beautiful message. So, uh, <coughs> there are two persons who want to join online. So, uh, we'll let, uh, allow them to join online. Just a minute. Whose way of talking? 
king whose appearance creates such an impression that we tell them as gentlemen all persons cannot be addressed as gentlemen but when i professor thought of the uh, when i was university student of bodmore university big student and it was 77 79 back it was debate for one or two years so i saw the chalk there was a bus going from uh, bodmore station to kolamba went for the university teacher was to get a stop so i was sitting in the bus and that gentleman was standing just in front of me i didn't know who is that gentleman. so naturally by seeing a gentleman standing so i offered the seat i let the seat be offered it he said no 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 young man. i have all sit down don't worry so naturally he did not accept my offer of the seat he kept on standing so it just naturally i was feeling a bit hesitant i was feeling very awkward that a gentleman senior to me he looked like a teacher he was standing in front of me and i am sitting so i also after a few minutes i am a sit and i told him sir it is not possible for me to sit in the bus the in the in the seat for why you are standing so after so many perspiration he is then when we got down at kolamba vartaman kolamba we started walking together then he said uh he asked me are you our student are you our student i said yes i am your student in a broader sense he asked why in the broader sense i told that i knew that you are from english man but i am from economics and i am your student in the sense i am in the stream of humanities and i am also a student of this university uh, by that time i came to know that yes he is a professor of english there so this is how that was my first interaction now during my whole student's life that chalavi i could not attend his classes because he was in english i was in economics but many of my students many of my student friends and my batchmates who were in english they used to say that they used to speak very high about professor the way of teaching way of telling the students etc so Three, three professors made the impact of monkey psychology on my uh, personality, on my thought, on my thought. Three professors, and two of them were from English, and one from my own object economics. Two from English was Professor Chandra himself, and another was Professor D K. it is not that i was their student but they are body posture they are way of conversation they are outward personality reflecting the and created an idea that yes we are the people whom we call teacher and they are something to see of object professor who he was just look like a uh, small of homes having a bench and and a long coat in the winter is and professor chandra was having a so it was not very sophisticated to be his face but who is what is wrongness in walking in talking was and up and another professor was professor gates like to be of economics so that was the first interaction from sanjoto first observation about from the sanjoto when i was student then the year of 1982 when i got the interview letter uh, to appear for the interview at kolkata just instant get from raj bhavan the government is is i met also from the year that place and that ambiance of the building on the interview room He created some uh, pressure and pressures like me, but since I was doing a job at the school, the department, I appeared with the impression, with the idea, with the knowledge that I had nothing to lose. I didn't know 
that Professor Chongku will be there in the interview board. Now in the interview board when I appeared, my third came. So what I can remember was one was economics expert Professor K.C. Malawani of IIT Kharapu, Professor Chandra himself and Professor G.H. then. Now by seeing Professor Chandra in the I got some courage, some proper now in the proper uh, sense that yeah, I need this gentleman. The title was forget, the expert started, this, that, this, that, etc. And Professor D.H. said, ask one question that our institute is an institute of a different sort than the general community university, where discipline and sincerity is at the highest level. Are you ready to abide by all these things? I said, yes. I will abide by all of the things that they question and I am going to adhere to all the discipline norms and everything. Then Professor Chukdu asked me that you seem to be very younger and ours is an engineering college where we teach a non-engineering subject like economics. So will you how to handle it? Will you be able to satisfy the students? That was the first question to ask me, will you be able to satisfy the students of engineering? Will you be able to attract the student to your subject, to your teaching, to your class, since you are in the non-engineering domain? I simply said one sentence. So, National Congress students is to 
uh, uh, to straight to the way uh, they uh, reacted when Mr. Chandra Peter, I I got the impression that he has been something uh, that students like it very much. Then uh, he introduced me. Here is a new chap, new guy. So he will take some classes with you, and uh, I hope that he will pop up. By saying this, he left. Then the students were uh, sitting and uh, looking towards me, some staring towards me, that uh, young teacher at the time. Anyway, so the class started, the ball started to win, and gradually uh, I made uh, uh, interaction with the students, and it was all successful. The point is that, after that process, Professor Chandra teams take the feedback and in a process of taking the stuff, Professor Chandra was acting outside the class and sometimes he was putting one class old, it was one uh, class window and he was looking through the window how the students are reacting to my classes, whether there is any disturbances and I noticed that was a Chandra is standing here. So after the classes, he called me and he said, yes, I listened to your lecture for some time. He got okay, okay. Now, the Professor Chandra at that time gave me some tips, gave me some lessons, which helped me and my teaching and my survival in the institute. My way, he told me that it is very, very difficult to survive <coughs> Engineering Institute by a engineering It is very, very difficult because the students, students and other teachers, other teachers because there is a gap, there is a some silent uh, boundary between engineering and non-engineering. There is a clash and rivalry between engineering and non-engineering. But if you can come from flying colors, if you can teach bravely, you can teach properly and sincerely. So he gave me some tips. What was always be prepared while we go to your master, number one. And never be hypocrite. Never be hypocrite because a teacher must not be a hypocrite. So then I asked him. What do you mean by that hypocrisy? He said that if a student asks you any question and if you do not know the answer, simply you say, I do not know the answer, I will tell you in the next class, you go, get yourself prepared for the next class, and you answer their query in their questions. Secondly, he said that if you can teach properly, if you can deliver your pictures in the extremely, then students will not bother who is from English, who is from economics, who is from mechanical, who is from electrical, etc. Et Number one. Secondly, he said, students will not bother about where from you have got this degree. Whether you are from Oxford or Cambridge or Oxford or MIT or Presidency of Kolkata or a professional college like ours because I belong to a professional college of Vardhavad but what is a professional town and a professional university students will not come around but they simply count this what matters most to them is your way of delivery is your way of teaching whether you can paste your subject interestingly to them always keep it in mind which I try to remember all through my life, all through my life, and that helped me a lot. But whatever, uh, whatever I have received, whatever I have explained, whatever respect, love I receive from my spirits, if the credit goes to Mr. Chandos uh, Groovy at that time, then, and I saw that the students they did not bother up. So naturally, very soon. Uh, uh, I, I captured the audience, he captured the audience and Professor Chandra, the important uh, news that he has everything to invite. Now, at that time, so when I, I was a uh, computer from Bordeaux to the 
mountain, I did not get it. Now when I got the water, water and weather is our a teacher's water, it was yes, but it's key. Prabhupada Chandra entered into my own master and Amulati. Um, we shared the room at the last of the Yasmini Hall. At the last of the Yasmini Hall, we shared together. And Prabhupada Chandra came to my room and gave the key, gave a key, Chami. He said that here is the key to your earth. Not with the house, but like water. Now, I expect. You will soon bring your Maroni. You will soon bring your Maroni. So, here I give you God. It is your responsibility to bring your Maroni. It was in 83, at that time I got married. So, after that, when I got married, then naturally I took my wife to Mr. Chandra's house at the Nicole Park. And I, I went there for several times. Now, during that time, Professor Chandra uh, went to uh, Shimla and he gave me a, a bullet garment to test this up for that. Okay, I'll be very quick my main thing. What is interesting is that he used to teach one subject, one uh, novel or one story, one book of George Orwell. That is projected as anti communist And you know that even RXC was known, or known as the was first of a day of doctrine student. Okay? Day of doctrine student. There are several, there are several uh, famous uh, doctrine students leaders who were passed out of these institutes. And incidentally, Professor Chandra was not a believer of communism. So in that book of George Orwell, which he used to teach, so students were not very happy uh, for the choice of the book. But students were simply struck with respect for the way of his teaching. And students, there are the all the students actually uh, want to what extent is very successful or not. You can get the impression not from the first venture, from venture, but from the back venture. Even the adventures students they used to say that he was a dream of a teacher. So even though he used to teach a non-communist and the communist school, but the students of the communist uh, believer of some students they respected Professor Chandra like And I know a study that Professor Chandra used to live at that time at B six by eight one. Where I started living, where I started living, Rick on the left, and I was alone at that point. And okay, somehow they knew that Professor Chandra is in the good book of policemen. And the policeman also knew that Professor Chandra, though he is a teacher, but he is not a communist believer, so he can be our informer, something like that. And one day at that time, Frequently the police or the spy used to visit, used to raid the campus to jab the Noxadet students. So at one point of time, the students, they take some weapons and the bomb explosive, uh, uh, explosive in the water of uh, that V6 by K and knowing fully well, the police will not come uh, to start. That was the case. The police came, they searched near the honeymoon school, but they did not enter this in by day, knowing that there will be nothing. But such was the relationship between the students and the teacher. And lastly, by the way, I say one thing that there were two pictures in the concept of the truth. One was a photograph which was displayed. So when I saw it, I, I told him, you know, sir, you look like a Chomipisha of Monsako. So he was very happy in his last life. And uh, another photo, it was a painting. It was a painting by one of the students of Gideon Hari College. Second or third or fourth class picture. So it was just like over the club, a lady sitting in a garden uh, with a moon, full moon. And probably three is 
either press amend or he is satisfied with material desired material habits. So regularly, whenever I enter Prophet Muhammad's room, I used to notice that picture and I requested him, sir, why do you leave? Why do you turn? And plus I have to request, give this room for me, give this painting for me, which he has given. So anyway, I do not want to broaden uh, uh, it. Uh, so I pay my respect for so long as I will be alive or till my last breath, I will remember in tears that I will never forget whatever I have I have today. My teaching career, my teaching psychology, my teaching personality has been proved greatly by Professor Tom. She is not a professor, she is a teacher. Nowadays we say faculty, but there is a faculty, but is a teacher and faculty. Faculty is a complicated term who pay much attention to us, they call, teach, teach, that, etc. But a teacher, the teacher, Professor Dabro, is some sort of that category of shape. So again, I pay due respect to my professor, Dabro, and he put on wrong. I watch and analyze their book of data, Professor Chandra Sir. So I am very unfortunate that uh, I, I did not uh, make myself present. Okay, with this, thank you all. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay. So uh, uh, we have come now to the last, uh, second phase of the program where Dr. Sukriti Usal, I am sorry Dr. Usal that he has taken much time. So um, uh, for this memorial lecture on the topic of uh, mapping the uh, culture, mapping the mutated phase of culture. Very interesting topic for all of us and Dr. Sukriti Usal has been the principal of MUC Women's College Part 1 for quite a number of years and doing his job quite efficiently besides being an academic of report. So I request Dr. Devasis Chakravarti or faculty to felicitate Dr. Kosal with a bouquet and a uttari. by the government of West Bengal. So, at the beginning, let me convey my heartfelt regards to uh, Professor Eshan Chanda. Uh, I was privileged to be student, one of his students, and uh, in our class we had one name for him, Saturday Express. He was so fluent, so articulate, he would come on every Saturday, and many aspects of this great teacher have been covered by many of his former students and colleagues. I would just, before I come to my topic, I just want to shed light on one or two points, which I think that, uh, have not been specifically covered, though broadly these points have been covered. In fact, before I attended the class of Dr. Chondo, uh, I had no idea how a novel should be taught. So, novel, teaching poetry, teaching plays, and teaching a novel, these actually are two 
two different forms of teaching. And novel teaching is actually very challenging. You cannot go by the lines, but you have to acquaint the students with all the important aspects of the novel. That Professor Chandra could do so meticulously, so enviably well. And I attended the class of Professor Amitabha Sina, most probably I recall his name. He was also a great teacher of novels and teaching at Kolkata University. And I can place Professor Chandra even above Amitabha, Professor Amitabha Sina, which class I attended at Kolkata University. And another aspect, today we uh, experiment with student-centric method of teaching, etc., etc. But Professor Chong, though in those days, he taught me four decades back, in those days, in the class, he had a very, uh, very um, unique way of uh, delivering his points, putting emphasis on the points where emphasis is to be put. And uh, he sometimes, occasionally, because we were coming from village schools, not English medium schools, and in order to enrich our vocabulary, you would occasionally arrange uh, what you call uh, vocabulary quiz in the class. And that is a very unique student-centric method of uh, enriching uh, the vocabulary of the students. And I had other aspects of Professor Chondo to, uh, I wanted to shed light on, but since we are running short of time, therefore I won't go to uh, those details. But let me again uh, extend my pronoun to this uh, legendary professor who has been rightly pointed out here as a legendary professor and I am coming to my topic. In fact, when you are, uh, I think there are worthier persons to discuss uh, and also to uh, speak on this particular prestigious occasion and delivering the memorial lecture, first memorial lecture for Sokeshan Chanda. Here at least before uh, us we have Dr. Rama Kundu, who was a direct student of Professor Rama uh, Chanda and who was also my teacher. I have Dr. Jana, who is as good uh, as my teacher, though uh, uh, I never um, was a student of his class. But I, I had occasions of interaction with him, and I know that uh, they would have been uh, a better speaker, far better speakers than me. Anyway, when the task of, uh, let us say, speaking on a topic at the past memorial lecture of Professor Chandra has been uh, placed on me. Let me try to do justice to it at, uh, to the best of my own uh, let us say, capacity. Uh, any lecture, uh, that any talk, uh, a, a, any uh, kind of occasion to share my thoughts with the audience, that creates a space for me to focus on a particular topic. And I um, am thankful to the organizers because they have also created this opportunity for me to focus on a particular topic. Uh, I had read many books and articles on culture and uh, the change of culture, how the, the semantic shift in culture, etc., etc. And I have, uh, I have, let us say, phrased my topic as mapping the mutated place of culture. Now, culture, as you know, is a very complex and very polyvalent term. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, when you speak on culture, that is both an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage in the sense that the topic is so vast. You say anything that comes within the purview of culture. And it is a disadvantage because we have to, uh, let's say, consolidate things, you have to organize the various aspects and uh, say something that is meaningful. Uh, we do not have time to go to the roots, root meaning, but if we go to Oitireo Brahman, there we come across this particular, uh, you know, uh, slogan where culture has been uh, described as, uh, you know, in Atto Samaskriti Bhagavad Silpani. That means the artists, they worship God by creating art. And uh, when they, uh, uh, say, uh, th th that, is, that does not open any door to heaven, uh, 
creation of art, but they get, get spiritually elevated when they create some art. And we know that in, even in the West, Matthew Arnold, when Matthew Arnold was talking about sweetness and light and study of perfection, etc., etc., all these things had, he had in mind. I do not have time to elaborate uh, because I will have to wind up within uh, quarter past five. Now, when, uh, how to locate culture and how to, let us say, acquaint us with the function of culture, culture in the sense of, let us say, uh, culture in a broad sense, I'm coming to that, but culture in this Vedic uh, sense or in the Arnoldian sense of culture, which something gives you a chance to uh, elevate your soul, Atto Sanskriti, as you call it, study of perfection, sweetness, and light. But Karl Marx, uh, you know, looked at culture from a different angle. When he was thinking of the soul elevating, uh, you know, elements of culture, Karl Marx had said that, uh, you know, sculpture consists in a special type of human action. Special type in the sense that it is not dictated by any uh, uh, heaven. Humans do it, perform it. Uh, not the platonic sense of culture that you will get possessed and gods are making you right, you are just playing the role of a scribe, not in that sense. But human beings do it, human beings create it, and in economic and uh, philosophic manuscript of 1844, Karl Marx said something very important. He said that one particular creation distinguishes man from animals. Animal creation is dictated by fulfilling the needs, but a man produces even when he is free from physical need and truly produces in freedom thereof. That means when a bee produces honey, that uh, production is dictated by physical needs, but when a poet writes a poem that is uh, actually a unique type of creation because it uh, implies freedom from needs and Marx also pointed out, now if you are creating not being liberated from the physical needs, then your creation may not come to that level. He said that for the starving man, it is not the human form of food that exists, but only its abstract being at food. That is, for the starving man, there is no difference between food, whether it is raw or whether it is cooked, whether it is clean or dirty, etc., etc. Then Marx also pointed out that culture is part of ideology, therefore it belongs to the superstructure, and the superstructure, you know, forget about the orthodox Marxist superstructure, is capable of influencing the base, and not only that, sometimes even undermining the base. So that was the Marxist uh, approach, but even when we come to Marx, we find that culture is taken in a restricted sense. Culture is not whole way of life. Later on we find that culture has been looked upon as a, you know, Marx focuses on the material aspects of culture, no doubt, but the meaning is somewhat restricted in the sense that it is not still looked upon as a whole way of life. But in 1871, Edward Tyler, who was an anthropologist, he gives you a definition of culture. Culture is that complex soul which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. So we find a semantic extension, expansion here, and uh, any, everybody, you know, a culture, culture producer, an artist is a culture producer, as well as a, you know, someone who cooks food, he is a culture producer. So singing to cooking to, uh, you know, even how you are using your cell phone, all these come under the purview of culture when we uh, take culture in this sense of the term. Now there is a part of the semantic uh, uh, shift we uh, find when we come to Raymond Williams, Raymond Williams uh, says that culture is not epiphenomenal, that is, it, has, it is not something that doesn't have any material significance, it has a material significance, then culture 
uh, helps us understand the true nature of art, true nature of uh, democracy, true nature of industry, class, etc. Culture is ordinary. All these things we know. I do not have time to uh, elaborate. But one important thing that was added by Raymond Williams is that the history of our idea of culture is a record of our reactions in thought and feeling to the changed conditions of our common life. So this means that we, how we are responding to our surroundings, to our states of life, and as you know, your environment, your surroundings, your conditions of life are always mutating, changing. Therefore, culture is also bound to change. So culture is not something which is, let us say, ossified and which will come down to you from the past. Not uh, looked upon, when culture is not looked upon in that way any longer. Then, now, culture, if culture has dynamism, it does, it changes. Why does it change? It changes, you know, I'm quoting a line from Alexander Gramsci, who in Culture, Change and Identity, that essay, Gramsci says, change is the interplay between historical contingency, context, and communication between these social actors or cultures. So why culture changes? That is here explained. It is, uh, let us say, the conditions are changing, conditions of life are changing, therefore culture is also changing. I have uh, given a few examples here, I do not have time to elaborate. Say, material practices mutated over the years. First there was coffinless, you know, burying, then weaker basket used at uh, in a coffin, then wooden structure used as coffin, then sarcophagus, you know, decorated stone box that was used as coffin, then ceramic holder. So we find changes. And another, there is an article by Gautam Bhattu and Philip Ludgendorf on tea colonization. How tea was an elite beverage in colonial India, but then subsequently it uh, that uh, well, changed into a drink of the working class household and that had been explained elaborately by uh, focusing on a few pictures. I do not have time to here show the pictures, a dark skinned Indian woman offering tea to the middle class parents testing tea with their children. So we find thus changes, uh, changes inevitable in culture. Now let us try to identify culture uh, defining by negation. Defining by negation, this is a process of, you know, busting a few prejudices, what is wrong when you uh, discard that, you define by negation. Uh, uh, no, what about culture? Culture is not just having a wristwatch, but keeping time, since it is a whole way of life. So you are culture, not because you are, you have good taste for Ravindra Sulti, not that. That is also part of culture, but True culture is not just having a wristwatch, but keeping time, not acting roles. You are a good uh, histrionic uh, um, skill. No, not that. But whether you are capable of performing any role, say your mother is sick, whether you are, can attend her, your wife is sick, whether you can cook. So performing any role, even household roles, not a costly dish, but eating without wasting food not a commode in the washroom but keeping it clean, not checking under many a what, but enjoying it, not destroying nature in our time, not destroying nature for development but having ecological concerns. You know that uh, in a, if you know, there is a story that if our uh, the age of earth is 4.6 billion, that is 460 crores years and if we change the scale and understand it by 46 years then industrial revolution took place just one minute ago and 50 percent of the uh, you know the forest coverage has gone had uh, you know disappeared from the earth within the span of that minute so man that's why he said man is the only creature that cuts trees makes paper and rice save trees on it we do not yet go paperless so another uh, uh, interesting story of, uh, you know, in 1919 post-revolutionary Russia, there was a food crisis. Canned meat, uh, you know, was uh, available. A ship had come from part of Europe and 
people wanted food, but the um, um, officers they won't allow that food to be taken to the household. They were waiting for the decision of the central committee. And Lenin said that they do not have culture when for distributing food among the hungry, if you have to take the you know, permission of the central committee, that is not actually culture. So culture, uh, we have to understand in that way. Then culture, as we know, is a site of contestation. Always a number of conflicts and tensions are going on at that particular site. And what kind of contestations we can have, say, uh, with William Raymond Williams, when he talked about ideology, he said that three different, uh, uh, you know, currents are always there in the, the cultural level. The, uh, um, that which is, uh, is already obsolete or dying, and then that which is dominant and that which is coming. So dying, dominant, and developing. We may say that these three have been phrased by uh, uh, no, uh, Raymond Williams as residual, dominant, and emergent ideology. And what are the characteristics of this uh, ideology, etc. This is, I do not have time to elaborate, but let us say that this is a, this type of, con, you know, um, tension or conflict is going on, it is a contestation of different aspects and then rural urban divide that is global culture versus popular culture that uh, no, no conflict is also going on rural space is severely constricted and uh, the rural people they produce but they are losing ownership over their products and then you have another form of conflict which has been very uh, appositely praised by Bakhtin uh, Mikhail Bakhtin as a uh, kind of contestation or conflict between the centrifugal and the centripetal forces. The centripetal forces, if you uh, allow that to dominate, then the culture tends towards univocalization. It loses, let us say, uh, it tends to be monological, it is not dialogical. And if you allow centrifugal forces to uh, play its role, then you adopt a non puritanical dehierarchical hybridized approach. So dialogue allowing intermixing of culture, that is a, a, a token of civilization and we should uh, allow that. Then uh, community specificity of culture, everybody knows that, I am skipping it. Certain attributes, the salient attributes of culture that I understand it, is that culture is not innate but it is acquired because if the child is born uh, cultureless, then culture has a temporal dimension. That is, culture is different from fashion. Fashion comes and goes, but culture uh, continues. Though culture changes, certainly culture mutates, but culture is not as transitory, as ephemeral, as fashion. And then uh, uh, there is, uh, we make certain, though today, we think that everything is included in culture and there should not be any hierarchy. I Bhaktin also said de hierarchy. But uh, uh, we make certain uh, differences between culture on the degree of sophistication made by culture, basis of, okay, for example, if you consume hooch and if you consume ram, so you certainly are a sophisticated person, you uh, consume ram, and then commercial film or art film. Now, insofar as culture is understood as art, a refining agent, a sophisticating agent, an agent that brings a, a, a touch of sophistication, gives a touch of sophistication to your mind, to your thoughts, to your soul. In that sense, culture has certain aspects, very salient aspects. You know, paradoxically, of course, you have to understand it in terms of paradox. Culture has a link with mind. Atto Sanskriti, Bab Silpani, that is true. But that is not, you, culture cannot be wholly mind-centric because culture also consists in acquiring the skills, doing all the works. So it, it has connection with mind, but it is not wholly mind-centric. It, it has diversion value. Yes, when we go to culture, we uh, sometimes culture in the sense of art, we look for entertainment. But it is not certainly wholly, exclusively entertainmental. Then it has market value, no doubt. 
but it is not solely commercial. And then culture is appreciated by the connoisseur. It is the food for the people who can understand. Everybody cannot uh, have that level of maturity to respond to the subtle uh, culture products. But it is not to be understood as an elitist thing. For example, uh, Tolstoy once had very categorically said in what is art, to defend this art, that is elitist art, on the grounds that it gives pleasure to the to a few, is as immoral as defending slavery because the master enjoys his comfort. So, uh, we uh, know that culture changes and why changes, uh, that we also have understood that the physical condition in which we live, culture is a form of response to our lived experience as the physical condition is changing, therefore culture also mutates. And one term has been used by Franz Boa, culture bull, brill, that is culture glasses. These culture glasses can help us understand the product, you know, that is culture products can reveal, reveal what history, values and attitudes, power relation, interrelation of communities, state and social development, all of these things. So uh, let us try to understand uh, a few things. For example, the broad spectrum, now we are coming to mapping the mutated face of culture, broad spectrum, for example, uh, how values have been imposed on uh, Indians or uh, we, the Indians who have been colonized by the British. We know that Indians, uh, especially Indian women, we live in a tropical country, they uh, did not have the habit of, rural women did not have the habit of wearing much clothes. But then Victorian, in the Victorian British eye, having scanty clothes was considered, uh, you know, being uh, barbaric, therefore it was looked down upon, it was loathsome, so we were asked to dress ourselves and we started taking up overcoat even in tropical summer, you know, those you lawyers, they are still bound to appear in the coat, in overcoat, dressed in overcoat. Then, in the 20th century time, that nudity has been valorized. Nudity has been attacked. That is, nudity is by choice. And so, now bikini has become acceptable. And we are sometimes even defending that as a part of the, you know, my life. How do I dress myself? That is my life. Now, that is obviously my life. But my point is, our values are changing because what values we inherit from our colonizing master, that values we come to acquire. So, that is one aspect. Then, uh, weighing of faith. If we just look at the puja pandal and how puja that uh, arranged, no, worship has become festival. Anjali, you go visit a pandal, uh, uh, not to pay your anjali, but to visit the pandal, uh, the decorative aspects you consent, and you uh, visitors there are not devoted, but they are revelers. And then the decline of scientific temper. We are living in time of Hubble telescope and nanotechnology, etc., etc. But you just try to imagine that in 1859, from Origin of Species was published, and all the 1250 copies of the first edition of Origin of Species were sold in a single day. The first day that was marketed. So people are showing much interest in scientific, day, but that scientific temper is disappearing. And you find today, open any television, and you find a number of astrology channels there. So uh, this is one thing. Then gadget fetishism, we find that uh, you know, husband and wife, the city, you know, lying on the bay, each you know, eye is glued to his or her, uh, you know, tablet or mobile. So, hamdo hamara do in a new form. No time to stand and stare. That is also another aspect of uh, the market and culture. What is the relation? Now, one thing is previously, what was valuable, that was sellable. Only if you have a published Gitanjali, that will sell in the market. It's because it contains some value. So, what was valuable was sellable. But now, what is marketable is considered valuable. 
If it is marketed well, then it is valuable. So this is the change, and this change is due to the market, the global market, global uh, playing the role. And uh, you see, in, we, let us pick up certain examples. For example, beauty is no longer lover's gift, as Shakespeare told us, but beauty is a gift of the parlor. Ruje ranga hoto kone, not laje. Ruje ranga hoto kone bohugo. So packaging matters. Even you something very trinket, very trivial thing, but you package it very fantastically, attractively, and it is considered a valuable gift. Then glamorizing shabbiness. You are glad no, worn out, you know, jeans. Worn out before you went. Even at the stock room, because it's the torn and dawn, you know, you know, jeans and you know, previously the Indian people, the poor people are forced to wear that. But now, so previously it was destiny of the poor, now it is the choice of the rich. That is the difference. So uh, another thing is incompatibility is overruled. What you find is that uh, you are puja pandal, uh, village heart and uh, let us say village ambience created, but thousand watt lamp and the indigenous is empty of its substance and commercializing you are focused on the market and you are commercializing the folk, folk and antique. Uh, why are you commercializing it? Because you are you are arranging for Adivasi dance as an interlude, not as a major show. There is a major show, major dance program. You are you have picked up some Adivasi dancers and you are presenting it as an interlude. So this is what has happened and we find that uh, even insofar as culture is concerned, we have some weakness for the culture that we inherit, though it, it changes over the time. For example, uh, uh, for example, the Bengali wedding, the uh, you know, groom appears in Punjabi and uh, Dhoti. Now nobody can wear dhoti these days. That's why you have uh, dhoti as trousers available in the market. So you want to wear that. You are not parting with that uh, let's say culture, that aspect of culture. But since market will not uh, uh, market is available here, market has a look on it, and you uh, find uh, another type of dhoti. Then uh, you see strategy. What are the what are the strategies for change of culture? Sometimes, shock strategy we find from newspapers. I found that in a restaurant in Kolkata, delicious dish, dish of luchi, mutton kosa, basanti pulao, is called Ajatin. And there are other names for Binoy, Badol, Dinesh, Aurobindo, Ghosh, Sabharkar, names of heroes who are respected. You, you know, have a dish in their name. This is actually a little bit shocking. And this shock is deliberately uh, opted for so that you can attract people. So this is a strategy. Then there is a strategy where you stoop to conquer. For example, Tumpa Sona Dupa Hampi Dena, that you know, folk song, uh, pop song, that pop song has been changed into Tumpa Tokeni Brigade Jabo. You, Think of the golden age of Bono Sangeet, of Solil Chaudhuri, Dhevuche, Karakche, or Wal, or Kothojatri. But uh, place, you know, why are you using it? Because you are using pop song, because this pop song will attract the younger generation and you are stooping to conquer. And then uh, another song, you see, uh, idol immersion, use of DJ. Even in Mahara, which is not actually an occasion for celebration, but an occasion for sadness, that there also you have DJ and the political, we find in all this shock therapy, the political is overshadowing the, uh, let us say, social. For example, in a post mala recently, the post mala uh, uh, billboards, there you find Tegos, image was miniaturized, and the image of the other uh, political leaders were uh, huge, uh, let's say, larger in size, uh, even sometimes larger than life. And in poster, I came across, I do not know whether it is real or it has been mocked. In a uh, poster that was, uh, let's say, 
created by one particular political party, Vivekananda Jayanti, 12th January, and there you find Vivekananda's face is not there. Only Vivekananda's name is there. So you find the political over roots, the, over shadows, the shadow, and social. Now, where our culture is going? Who is that moving? Let us have some, uh, let us say, uh, from uh, our experience, make some comments that in our present culture, performing us for grounded, literature has been background minded here, culture, by culture I mean not the entire field, but the elevating elements of the soul, uh, audio visual. Uh, more audiovisual than cerebral, that is, we read less and watch more, then in our time, promo or promotion, also negative promotion adds value. For example, Bhagavad uh, Gita promoted and Dostoji, another film, and Dostoji, I think that such a classic film. Uh, uh, Almost like Pothet Pachali. It has, been, uh, has earned many prizes uh, outside India. But here, hardly 10% uh, uh, of the people who are even film lovers, they know about those three. And you find that Pathan, negative health, it had a very rubbish film. I was also I want, I'm a film lover and I wanted to uh, watch it and I found it very disappointing. But so much of it. Let us say promotion was met. Then another aspect of culture that I must uh, let us say comment on is that culture today, uh, especially uh, uh, you find the popular culture, meteor like, blazing like fire, huge fire, bonfire, and then fizzling out within a day or two. Millions watch and transcribe all in all the languages, then forgotten. And a few examples are why this collaborate, collaborate the. I do not know how many of you remember this. Now, almost translated into all the Indian languages. And then, Manike Mage Gite, that we also know, and Kasavadam. <laughs> then, culture, interactive changes, that is, uh, causes of change, close contact, colonization, immigration. Information, communication, technology, revolution in that field. Diffusion is one form of uh, change, interactive change. For example, Shari Blaud, Shalwar Kamij. That is example of diffusion, uh, according to me. Acculturation means when you embrace one culture without uh, discarding your own culture, that culture you are born to, uh, balancing, uh, attempting to balance two cultures for what we try to do today. Uh, not very successful, of course, dinner table, taking food with hands. Table, not sitting on the floor, but taking food with your hands. Commode, but using, uh, not using toilet tissue. And assimilation. Assimilation is the result of prolonged acculturation. And here, minority subject group is, uh, accepts the values and beliefs imposed by the majority. For example, the sense of family. Family, Indian context, family included uncles, aunts, grandfather, grandparents, etc. etc. But today, our sense of family, parents, and children. So the sense of family is narrowing. We have taken it over from the West, and Namaste had taken, you know, given way to a handshake. Then certain cultural changes are really uh, uh, things of concern. For example, cultural, natural, Nationalism, where you try to homogenize culture, where you tend to depart from the secular principles, and your brain is so poison from the start, from uh, when you pick up the alphabet. And even see, uh, look, look at the uh, foolish decision, stupid decision of the animal welfare department <laughs> in a Valentine Day and cow heart. Now, uh, cow heart had been uh, uh, said the so hard day had become go hard day. <laughs> so this you find. One thing is here I want you no know, transformation of Valentine Day into a day for uh, showing your affection to animal is good. It's welcome. It is acculturation. But this is engineered acculturation 
because you do not uh, hug all the animals, but you hug only the animal which is, let's say, uh, uh, favorite of a particular group, you know that. And then cultural globalization, porn popularization, pornography was considered an aberration, not part of culture at all, not part of art at all, but it has been valorized and considered in the present context, economy of sexual fantasy, where you find dark web industry makes a cocktail of libido, pleasure psychology and market. And uh, there are certain uh, aspects of culture which are dying and new scope, calligraphy, handwriting, good handwriting that is dying, but you are destined to perish, but you have new scope, uh, you know, Microsoft gives you all, you know, infinite number of varieties of form of choice. Selfie is an example of social isolation. You do not have a frame to pick up your photograph, but selfie can also be appealed in the days to come. A new art form, cooking at home, gone, maybe, maybe not gone, but going, uh, departing, and you have Jomato and Swiggy and new job sector here that is one possibility and you can also get Naru, not homemade but uh, manufactured in an industry supplied to you during the puja day. Reality show, reality show, dazzling show, you find young, very young children, they are uh, performing fantastically well, catch them young. Uh, you in Gray's uh, eligibility in the country church here, Gray lamented that uh, um, the power is born to blush unseen and many gems are hidden in the um, uh, you know, bottom of the ocean. But these, thanks to the reality show, these are not going to uh, lie hidden on Thadam Ocean caves. But you catch them young, they give them no chance for grooming or orientation. And social festivals, social festivals, mind it, you know, Nobarno uh, or Thaimota, Immediately, on the same day, you find that in TV Syria. So every social festival, that is one aspect of positivity, the negative aspect it has, because there is no aesthetic distancing, but the positive aspect is, it might preserve certain aspects of our culture which are first dying. So that is one way of doing that, and one very uh, uh, silver lining that I came across recently is a celebration of promise day during the Valentine week, 11 February, that was uh, celebrated as oath taking day, oath against drug. So, if that is one form, if you that is, you know, promise day is part of Western culture, you transplant it in Indian culture, but in a different form and for social welfare. If you can do that successfully, we still have hope in our culture. That's all. Thank you. I never knew that Sukritida is so familiar with the current state of culture. So it was so enjoyable and insightful lecture. Thank you for, I think he has properly represented Professor Chandu's legacy. So we will end this program. I, I request Dr. Onsu Yajodhya to honor him with an uttariyam on behalf of the department. Uttariyam, uttariyam. Now I request the faculty members of the department, Dr. Devasis Chakravarti, Dr. Rungsu Jayudhya and Dr. Ninki Chokhani to come here and hand over a token of love, a memento to Dr. Gosal.
Dale, di que eso es, ¿sabes? Thank you all.